Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is New York Times bestselling writer Jocelyn Jackson. Jo- Jackson's latest novel is Mother May I. Jocelyn, welcome to the podcast. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Sure. Well, if someone hasn't yet heard about your novel, Mother May I, how would you describe the novel? Um, It's domestic suspense or a thriller. It is about privilege and um, the, the the dangers of not offering the world second chances. It is about a young, well, young or she's not young, she's 38. But so a regularly aged person, neither young nor old, who um, <laughs> has kids in private school. She grew up kind of on the wrong side of the tracks, but she got some opportunities. She married well. And the, and the book opens when she sees what looks like a an old woman watching her through her bedroom window. She and her husband are asleep and it faces the backyard and they have a six foot gated privacy fence. So that's creepy. Um, and she kind of sits up and looks and the person is gone. And so she, she discounts it as a dream. But then later at her children's, her older children's tiny private school, she sees the same woman out by her car and then she looks away for one minute and the little one, Robert, her 10 week old is just gone. And if you've ever read any of my books before, you know, this is not a straight up kidnap and ransom situation. In my books, the past has teeth and a pulse and it's coming for Brie. There's a, a, a revenge scheme in the works here. And it's about how far a mother will go to protect her child. And I'm curious, do you remember the original idea or impetus that led you to write Mother May I? I love, um, I'm a visual arts person. I love galleries and museums. And there was a um, a series of, a, a photography series called Abandoned America that really struck my imagination. It's all these places in America that have just, decayed and been you know they they are some of them were incredibly cheerful or functional and now they are in various states of decay and the one that really haunted me were the pictures of this old theme park and I started to think of it in terms of like justice and socioeconomics like Brie quickly learns you know this is not a spoiler this is what the book is about from the beginning um, that the the person who's taken her child is also a mother. And even though Brie is quite wealthy now um, and married into a family that is that has old money, she and this woman, this woman kind of discounts her as the society wife. But as they talk, because they're working together, because she has to do stuff for this woman to get her kid back, they start to learn about each other and their backgrounds are very similar. But where Brie got some breaks... Um, and her life went one way, this other woman's life went the other way. And, and both of them are fighting for their children. So even though this empathy happens between them, they're headed for like a bloody conflagration because it's their kids on the line. So, so it was this series of pictures where we were seeing like the, the American dream falling into hideous disrepair and, and how, uh, uh, I uh I I really like those. <laughs> <laughs> so what was your original writing journey that led you to writing and getting your first novel published? Oh, I think um my mother published my first novel when I was 3 <laughs> using the crayon and stapler method. Um I have always wanted to be a writer. I've always written. It is intrinsic to my nature it is not a thing i cannot do and i am basically incompetent at every other area of life i there's i'm one of those people that i can do like i can do one thing but i could do it really well you know my husband is like the kind of person who if you give him 15 minutes and a manual he can competently do anything like jack of all trades i think that's a better way to be But it's certainly more useful way to be, you know, when the giant Velveeta rats take over the planet. (laughs) Um, But I can do one thing. So I did the one thing I can do to the best of my ability. And and what was that that process like of of getting your first novel published? I mean, was it something where 
you uh, did tons of queries? Did you have to do yes, lots absolutely. of Yes, absolutely. I mean, I did. I you know I was at that point. It was I, I went to so I I went to school in theater, emphasizing playwriting. Mm -hmm. And I did my, I did an MA in um, literature with a specialization in creative writing. And part of the reason I did the MA was just because like, remember that thing I said where I can do one thing? They paid for me to do it. Like I, I got a teaching fellowship and I had sold some short stories at that point and had a play or two produced. So I got a, a fellowship and, um, and so it really was not, it was really about having deadlines and a place to live while I practiced writing when, and then I moved and that was in Chicago, which there was lots of opportunities for networking and meeting writery people. And then I moved to, I moved back home to Georgia and we <laughs> lived way out in the weeds. Cause I had a horse. It was so expensive to have a horse in Chicago. And we moved here, um, into the weeds. And I was very much, I felt very isolated. I really didn't have a writing community and, and there was no way to network or do anything like that. So I did the thing that I got, you know, I looked online, I got the book. I did what they told me to do. Like you, you write a query letter. Hey, my name is Jocelyn Jackson. Would you like to represent the Mr. New York agent? You know, and just <laughs> loaded them up in a shotgun and blasted them at New York. I, I wish. I had had advice at that point because it was a bad idea. Like, don't do that. If you're going to query, and you should query, you query 10 to 20 agents at a time. And then if you don't get a 10% to 20%, I would say request for partials. Your query's not good enough. Doesn't matter how good your book is. Nobody's looking at your book. Your query's not good enough. So then you rework your query and you workshop it and you get help. And then you send to another 20 agents and you should be getting 10, 20% asking for at least partials or your query is not good enough. So nobody told me that. Didn't know. Blasted 168 queries on the same date, New York City and the surrounding area. And um, <laughs> got 167 rejections. That was a fun two weeks. And one agent who said, I'm interested in you. Let's talk. And that was all it took was one agent. One agent who he was, he, he's still working to this day. He's in his 80s. He's just sold a book, I think, two weeks ago to, um, <laughs> he, he does a lot. Of, he's fallen into some weird niches. He just sold like, all right, no, that's what just came out. That like the new definitive Sylvia Plath biography. That's his. Wow. And then he also he also sold like a big seller for him was the Dungeons and Dragons cookbook. So like he's very eclectic. If he likes it, he likes it. If he doesn't li like his list is what I like. Um, and he he was very old school New York. We never had a contract. He just had a phone conversation with me where he said, this is what I'll do for you. This is what I expect you to do for me. And he nurtured me and fostered me. and. I gave him my first novel. It didn't sell. I gave him my second novel. It didn't sell. I got depressed and decided I wasn't going to try to shop anymore. And he kind of combination encouraged and browbeat me to like, hit your tail up and get back in there. And the third novel went, you know, it went to auction and it was amazing. Like it was amazing. And he was like, this is, this is good. It's good. Those two novels didn't sell. There's a difference between being published and published well. And when you have, Back then, I think it was big eight. I think, what are we down to now? Big four? Something when you like have, that. yeah, it's not great. It's not a great progression. But, you know, more than half of them were bidding. So that set me up to get a good marketing budget, which meant that people saw my books in bookstores. And then the reviews were good and the sales were good. So I've been able to have a career. So it, it was a blessing. Well, I know that you've narrated the audiobook versions of some of your novels. When you're writing, do you read aloud? Oh, yes. And I think everyone should. Well, I mean, first of all, as I said, I don't think everyone should read their own audiobooks <laughs> at all. <laughs> um, I trained as a voice actor. Like, my first degree was in theater. And I have worked professionally as a voice actor long before I was a published novelist. And worked professionally in regional repertory theaters, done, you know, regional commercials and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm an actor as well as a writer. And that's important. If you're going to be reading audiobooks, it's, 
But I do think every writer should read their stuff aloud. I, I don't just read my audiobooks anymore. Um, I started out reading mine and they, they did well and I've won some awards. And so I sometimes get offers to read other authors' books. And if it's hard to find the time, you know, I'm on deadline. Sure. And, uh, but if I love the book, then I will make time and do it because it's so fun. I just did um, Jen Phillips, one of the voices. I didn't have time to do, I did not have time to be reading any audiobooks, but it was Jen freaking Phillips. I love her <laughs> books. And um, it was just, it was one part. It was a multi-voiced thing. So I could get in and do it in a day and a half in the studio. And I was like, I will find the time. I want to read Jen Phillips. So, um, so I, I do that, you know, for other authors too. And, but, but I can tell most of the time when I'm t reading an audiobook if this is an author who reads aloud or not, or even just when I'm listening to an audiobook, I can tell. Like they're just in the most obvious way is the internal rhyme. Looking at the page, you may not notice that you just wrote, Cher put her bare hair over there. You know, you're not going to see those <laughs> rhymes. But when the audiobook reader has to find a way to read that sentence without sounding like Dr. Seuss, they will be cursing your ancestors. Um, and also just in terms of like rhythm and flow and avoiding like subject, verb, object, subject, verb, object, to just to have sentences that are structured in a way that like when you're writing an action scene, you want these short and here we go. And he ran, the knife came down, you know. The, you want, you can hear it when you're reading it aloud. And when it's a love scene, you, you can be more languorous or more urgent. And the sound of the words can convey that. If Interesting. So I'm curious, is the writing process the same for you from novel to novel or does it differ? Oh God, I wish it would differ. It's the same freaking thing every freaking time. <laughs> <laughs> I am I am a pantser. I am a I wish I was a plotter. I am not. If I know the whole plot, I'm bored and I won't write the book. I have to write my way to it. I I'm usually walking toward not really a plot ending, but a taste in my mouth. Like a thematic feeling or a taste that I want to get to. But a lot of times I'm even wrong about that. I have to I've I've learned that I'm Southern, I'm female. And I'm Generation X, which means, oh, Jeff, would you like to meet the living personification of passive aggression? It was me 10 years ago. And I it's still like they put it in the water down here. Um, especially I understand. I grew up in Macon, Georgia. <laughs> yeah, you know. So and, and luckily, the, the older I've gotten, the more direct I've been able to become. But it's so ingrained that in my writing, like i I tend to leash my characters because I'm worried some bottom might read this book and think I'm not very nice. Well, I'm not very nice, Jeff. So, you know, I don't know what I'm so scared of. Um, but I, I've learned that my subconscious mind and my will, my characters will start to want to do things that make Southern spineless me deeply uncomfortable. And if I let them, I get the book I want. If I just let them and just be uncomfortable. So, and that's a process and it's a process every time. I've, I've published 10 novels. I've written 12. I've written multiple full length plays and multiple short stories and two novellas. And it's the same every stinking time. That's interesting. I had not heard someone uh, articulate it in exactly that way. And I know, I know what you're talking about in terms of that Southern uh, politeness uh, and how that impacted your writing and, and, and your characters. Yeah, it can be debilitating. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess um, what you need to do next is write a self-help book for all those Southern women who want to break out of that. Um. Yeah. I mean, Sure. I don't know why anybody would take advice from me. I mean, you know, this is a podcast, so you can't see me, but I look like I like I look like I'm about to rise up and organize a bake sale. And I probably am. Like <laughs> so I have not escaped it at all. I've just allowed my characters to escape it a little bit. Do some murdering, create have some mayhem. I I Jeff, me, Jocelyn Jackson, 
I have never murdered anyone. So I'm still very <laughs> on the. Well, I'm curious, given your success as a writer, I mentioned it uh, at the beginning of the podcast that you are a New York Times bestseller. And I've interviewed uh, other New York Times bestselling authors, and I don't think I've ever asked them this question, but I'm I'm curious, how do you manage the pressure or stress of the career aspects, knowing, given your success to date, knowing the expectations of your agent and publisher and editor? Are you able to tune that out, or what do you do to tune that out when you're sitting down to a blank page? Um, you have to. If you don't, if you don't tune tune it out, it will eat it will eat you, and you won't have a career with any longevity. And I, this is the only thing I can do. So <laughs> I really want my career <laughs> to have longevity. And some books are going to do better than others, and some books are going to. You know, I mean, I've had a long career in a lot of, I had one book just freaking tank in the hardback. I mean, tank. And I was just distraught. Like, and then in, it came back in paperback and just did fantastic. And my agent was like, okay, this is how it is. Like, get off that roller coaster. Don't worry about the numbers. I'll worry about the numbers. I'll tell you when you need to worry about the numbers. As long as I'm not saying I'm worried we won't be able to get you a book contract, you're doing fine. I've got my eye on your money. I've got my eye on your... From HBO's Insecure and executive producer Issa Rae comes a new satirical true crime podcast, We Stay Looking. After investigating the disappearance of a missing Black woman and looking for LaToya, Terry J. Vaughn is back as Citizen Sleuth Rose Cranberry. Through comedy, We Stay Looking sheds light on the serious issues of systemic racism within the media and the criminal justice system. Produced by Radio and Tinderfoot TV with HBO, We Stay Looking is available December 8th on all podcast platforms. You can binge the entire season early, December 1st, on HBO Max. Kent State really does care about its students, and I think that if a student wants to feel supported throughout their time here and feel like they have someone to go to for help or for advice or just to talk, Kent State is the place for that. I, that's not your problem. And I, that's part of an agent's job. And it really helps if you super, super trust your agent. Like my agent was, uh, my agent, my current agent was my acquiring editor for my mm -hmm. first book. So this is a woman who loved my book enough to fight for it in-house at my first publishing house. She got it made a lead title. It was the number one book since Peg. It was like she worked to help. She loved the book. She loved my voice. She's fostered my career since day one. So, and that's what she told me as my editor too. Like if the sales aren't what we hope. You know, that's that that's mar marketing will tell us, but that's not our problem. Our problem is to put out the best book that you possibly can. That's your job. Your job is to make the book good. And sometimes even good books, they fall off the radar. It doesn't work, but that's not your job. Your job, write a book you love, that you're proud of, that it's that you can't possibly write a better book. And I just do that. Like, I mean, I wouldn't advise that if you don't, if your agent is a scumbag, <laughs> but you don't trust them, but, um, but you find you, a new agent. Yeah. You shouldn't have an agent yeah. that you can't trust and your fate, like your agent doesn't pressure you in your way, in those ways, your agent fights for you with your house. Like right. your agent is your team and they go in, like they're, they're the one who goes in and says, well, you know, my beautiful author is so lovely and would never create a fuss, but as her agent, I have to say this cover is terrible and it's not going to work. And you've got it like, they are your, they're your bad guy. They, they, get, they, they go to war for your book. They help, they remove that tension and conflict so that you can have a really, in an ideal world. And I live in an ideal world, agent wise, mine is amazing. Um, so that you can have a really creative, an open relationship with your editor. Like I have never spoken the word contract with my editor. My editor and I talk about how can we make this book better and what can we do as editor and author to help marketing get this book into the hands of readers. Those are the kind of conversations I have because that's my job. My job is to write a really good book and then my job is to do anything they ask me to do to help with marketing and promotion. That's great. Well, 
What writing advice would you offer for those who are working on their own stories and novels? Um, a couple of things. The first thing is read. Literature is a conversation. And if you're just writing, I I always despair when I meet writers or, you know, people. And it's it's very seldom most of the people I know who are working in the publishing industry are avid, crazy pants readers who like get in bar fights, you know, they get in bar fights over the ending of Shine, Shine, Shine. Like they're, they're serious about it. They want to talk about the secret history because they just read it for the 35th time. Um, and if you're writing and you're not reading, you're in a conversation where you're just talking and you don't even know what the conversation's about because literature goes in movements um, and it goes in arcs and conversations become relevant. And if you're listening and, you know, there, you can be precious about it and you can say, well, I don't want to write on trend. I have a vision and a voice. Well, that's great for you. I love that. I love that journey for you. But you, there's a conversation happening about what the world is like and your place in it or what history is like or what, I mean, there's a, find the conversation that's happening that's relevant to your interests and listen, listen to that conversation by reading and then put your voice in. The second thing I would say is don't read a book that says this is how you write a novel because no book can tell you this is how you write a novel. It tells you how that person thinks you should write a novel. You need to read 25 books that tell you this is how to write a novel and then try them on like hats and shoes and and find the process. Your process is going to be your process. And you can pick and listening to other writers, how they do it, and then pick and choose what works for you. And I mean, I failed. I, I thought I failed as a writer because I love Bird by Bird. I still make everybody I've ever, ever run across who wants to be a writer read it. <laughs> but I, her thing of write every day and put the candle on to have law of your writer brain. That does not work for me. If I do that, I just throw those pages away. They're bad. Sometimes I have to not write for two weeks to, and just I take really long walks and I'm way in my head and I walk into walls and then I figure something out and then I write furiously for two weeks. Yesterday, I'm in a, I'm, a, I'm on a tear right now. I wrote 7,000 words yesterday and 3,000 of them are not terrible. So that's great. Like that 7,000 words, I'm going to throw away the bulk of them. But the 3,000 kind of okay ones are going to grow into the next 10,000, 20,000 words of my novel over the next two, three weeks. So what novels have you read recently that you enjoy? Oh, um, I loved Plain Bad Heroines. I loved Mexican Gothic. I, I, everything I'm saying has a supernatural element, and I don't, I don't know why. I liked oh Mary Kubica, Little Woman Missing. That's a good one. I just got back from the beach where I read three books I loved: um, Clara and the Sun, um, Karen Slaughter's new one. Uh, is it False Witness? I can't remember, but it's I read every Karen Slaughter. So there you go. And then um, I'm right in the middle of the other Black Girl, which I'm loving. Um, and then right now on, on, uh, on audio, I'm listening to, um, a nonfiction. I, I can't remember the name of it, but it's Jenny Lawson's third book broken, but in a good way. I can't remember the title of it, but I always listen to her books. She's another author who reads her own audiobooks and should like a lot of times I want to say to authors, please don't do that. But Jenny Lawson should do that. She's great. <laughs> That's great. And when do you listen to audio when you're taking oh, these long walks? Yes. When I, when I walk the dog or when I exercise or when I ha when I'm forced, when I'm forced to clean the house, you know, sometimes I'm forced to, it has to happen sometimes. <laughs> so like when I have to do the kind, those kind of chores where I can't be reading with my eyes, I just put an audio book on. I'm not like when I write, I have music on. And lyrics don't bother me. Like I like background noise, but when I, but I don't like to pay attention to music. I like music to just be on. So when I'm doing something that requires attention to where music won't entertain me, like 
the dishes. I listen to audiobooks and That's podcasts. Great. Do you have any podcast recommendations? Um, I. <laughs> what do you enjoy? I like. There's a. Uh, oh God, I'm so bad at titles, as you have seen already. That's fine. Um, you can. I like. There's one. I like the one where the girls don't get murdered. Um. Stay. Yeah, uh, I know what you're talking about. Um, yeah, I, lo- I know. I, I like to listen to podcasts about murder, but yeah. I'm a thriller writer, so I mean, of course, I like to listen to podcasts about murder. I also like the one. It's Welcome to Something Town, where the guy is just like reading. Welcome the to news. Night Vale. Welcome to Night Vale. I, I, that to me, I can just. I I don't listen to it in order. I know it must be cumulative in some way, but I just freaking love it. I just put it on at random wherever it happens to be so it's kind of a bra and there's a a one that interviews people from nonprofits. i do a lot of work i volunteer and serve on the board of a nonprofit that is very dear to my heart so i listen to some nonprofit podcasts that's great uh i'm trying to find that name of the of the now it's like driving me crazy of the true crime post my favorite murder Yes. <laughs> They're funny. <laughs> they, they are, are they funny. Are. Yeah. They are. Great. Well, where can people find you online if they'd lear- like to learn more about you and your novels? Well, I am. So my name is spelled weirdly. It's Jocelyn, but it looks like Jocelyn. And so, and I'm just me under my name everywhere Jocelyn Jackson on Instagram, Jocelyn Jackson on Twitter, Jocelyn Jackson on Facebook. And my website is jocelynjackson.com. So, um, and my, my, I've kind of gone a little bit. I'm just about to get back into Instagram. I'm on deadline. So I'm, I'm just in the, you know, I'm just in the bunker right now. <laughs> but my Instagram is my favorite social media. That's where you're most likely to find me. It's mostly my cats, things I'm reading. And whenever I have a release come out, you know, you're going to have to hear a lot about my new book. But in between that, oh, and my daughter and I do a show called We Eat Things So You Don't Have To. Where we find the weirdest foods we can <laughs> and eat them and review them. And where can people find that on Instagram or what? Instagram. That's all, okay. that's all my Instagram stuff. There you yeah. go. Instagram's my favorite social media. And it, it I mean, I, I should be, I'm going to be better about it, Jeff. I'm, you've inspired me to be better because I have lots of books I want to talk about right now. I've been doing a lot of reading because I went to the beach. Um, and I would just write all morning and read all afternoon. That's great. Well, again, we've been speaking with Jocelyn Jackson, author of the new novel, Mother May I. The novel is on sale now, so go buy a copy. And Jocelyn, thanks for doing this interview. Jeff, thank you. I had so much fun. Great. Now, stay tuned for a brief excerpt from the audiobook of Mother May I by Jocelyn Jackson. Read by Jocelyn Jackson. Available from Harper Audio wherever audiobooks are sold. I woke up to see a witch peering in my bedroom window. She was little more than a dark shape with a predator's hungry eyes, razor wire skinny but somehow female, staring in through the partly open drapes. Sunrise lit up the thin silvery hair that straggled out from under her hat. I should have leaped up screaming. I should have run at her with any weapon I could find. Instead, I thought, I hope she's not standing on my basil plants, hazy and unworried. Even half asleep, I knew that there was no such thing as witches. I'd long forgotten the most important thing the theater had ever taught me, that the human body can hold two truths at once, even truths that seem to rule each other out. There's no such thing as witches, true. And I was looking at one. I didn't understand she might be a real person until our eyes met. Hers widened in surprise. She lurched sideways and was gone, leaving me with the impression of a craggy old lady face with a sour turned down mouth. I bolted upright, heart rate jacking, letting out a strangled sound that wasn't quite a scream. Too soft to disturb the kids, but it woke up my husband. Bree? Trey's voice was thick with sleep. 
I thought I saw someone looking through the window at us. That got his eyes open. A person in the backyard? He was already climbing out of bed. There was a careless six-inch gap between the edges of the drapes. Even as he pushed one all the way aside, my rational brain was catching up, trying to dismiss it. I said, it was a witch. I mean, I thought I saw a witch, so grain of salt. Trey was peering out, forehead pressed against the glass, but that turned him back to me, a smile starting. Big pointy hat? The memory was dream-soaked, but when he said it, my brain made it so, snapping my hazy mental picture into focus. Not a cardigan, a tatty robe. Not a knit cap, a pointy witch hat. It made the whole thing ridiculous. Of course there was no witch in our backyard, staring in with hungry, haunted eyes. I think so, I admitted. Her mouth was sunken in, and she was all in black. I must have been dreaming, I decided. I was prone to postpartum nightmares, though not usually about anything so concrete as witches. My bad dreams after each of the girls had been almost Victorian, all footsteps and fog. The gate is closed and locked. Unless your witch looked spry enough to bounce over an eight-foot privacy fence. That made me laugh, though it was more of a relieved puff of air. <laughs> nope. Trey let go of the drapes. Want me to go outside and check? Do I want you to sashay around the backyard in your boxers looking for a witch? I asked. No, no, I do not. He grinned and I smiled back even though the animal at the base of my brain was saying that yes, actually, I did want him to he-man out there and stomp the perimeter, preferably with a golf club cocked up over his shoulder. It was a primal thing, physical and irrational. There was no witch, obviously, and even if I had seen someone, a flesh-and-blood little old lady was the least threatening type of person on the planet. Only in stories did crones offer poisoned fruit to princesses or snatch up tasty children. But I couldn't think of an innocent reason for anyone to watch us as we slept. And her flat, greedy gaze, not confused or blank like someone's sweet lost granny. Her hunger was the clearest thing in my memory. Trey read my doubt. Seriously, I'll grab some pants and go check, just to put your mind at ease. I shook my head. I'd been raised on Grimm's fairy tales by a mother who saw the world as something huge and wild, carnivorous. Her world was full of witches. She'd have already called the cops by now, or even snatched one of Trey's hunting rifles out of the gun safe and loaded it. She'd be in the backyard already, making the world safer by accidentally shooting our neighbor's nice old labradoodle. Or worse, shooting our nice old neighbor. I wasn't like her. I didn't want to be like her. So I pushed away that small, wise voice in my head that kept insisting, You saw something. You saw someone. Some coffee's fast, but not fresh. Some coffee's fresh, but only after a long wait. Speedway coffee is made fresh at the push of a button, hot or iced, so you can have fresh coffee your way, right away. Find a store near you at speedway.com slash locations. From HBO's Insecure and executive producer Issa Rae comes a new satirical true crime podcast, We Stay Looking. After investigating the disappearance of a missing black woman and looking for LaToya, Terry J. Vaughn is back as Citizen Sleuth Rose Cranberry. Through comedy, We Stay Looking sheds light on the serious issues of systemic racism within the media and the criminal justice system. Produced by Radio and Tenderfoot TV with HBO, We Stay Looking is available December 8th on all podcast platforms. You can binge the entire season early, December 1st, on HBO Max.